Ross Douthat, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for coming. Ross, I think your book really encapsulates something that we've tried to, I mean, this is place is called The Realignment, and this, I think, lays the groundwork for how did we become a society that it has so much malaise and set the groundwork for the political moment of 2016. And so just could you launch, give us a top line kind of takeaway of how did we end up with the decadent society, as you call it? I mean, basically four or five different trends sort of converged and interacted with each other in Western society over the last 40 or 50 years. And in the book, I date the story to the moon landing because that's a convenient sort of peak of human accomplishment and daring. Were any of us alive start, when the moon start. landing <laughs> happened? I mean, I was, you know, I was an idea in the mind of God. I don't yeah, know about yeah. you guys. <laughs> That's right. Um, but, it's, but it's also a useful place to start because there really was some sort of shift in the Western world somewhere between the mid-1960s and the mid-1970s where, one, economic growth slowed down, didn't disappear, but it slowed relative to the post-war norm. Um, and it has remained with various fits and starts slow ever since. Um, Two, you had the beginnings of what has now sort of built up to a world of total political stalemate and sclerosis, where you have this interaction between constitutional structures, um, polarized political parties, and the current media landscape that means that it's basically impossible for anyone to get anything done, or maybe a president can pass one piece of legislation Mm -hmm. as Obama did and then pay for it for the rest of his presidency. Um, Does the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act (laughs) fall into that category? The Tax Cuts, yeah. yeah. I mean, Trump, you know, Trump was able to pass one bill, and it was, you know, the kind, it was sort of a decadent version of the (laughs) Reagan tax cuts, (laughs) if you will. It wasn't the worst thing in the world. Um, That's branding, ladies and gentlemen. But everything is, no, once once you, once you identify decadence, you just can't stop seeing it everywhere you look. That's the, that's the, if you, if you read this book and walk outside, it'll just be bing, decadence, bing, decadence everywhere. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so the economy slowed down, politics became gridlocked. People stopped having as many babies, first in Europe and then East Asia and now the United States. So society started getting older and older. Um, And then interacting with all of this, there seemed to be a kind of technological slowdown, which has been disguised a little bit by the big exception, Silicon Valley. We all have amazing computers in our pockets, but really technological progress has been concentrated in one area of the economy instead of being spread out everywhere. And you can see that in productivity statistics, which have been lousy for many years. Um, And then finally, and all of those I think are pretty provable and obvious, but then I think you also have a kind of cultural and intellectual repetition that's set Mm -hmm. in, where you end up having the same political debates that we had in the 1970s, the same theological debates inside American Christianity that we've had since the 60s. And, you know, we keep making the same blockbuster comic book movies over and over again. We're sort of living off the cultural capital of the baby boom generation and most of pop culture, which is not maybe the most important part of decadence, but is kind of the most fun to talk about. Yeah, definitely. So before we sort of go into, because in the book you sort of describe those four themes as stagnation, sterility, sclerosis, and repetition. Yeah. I want to talk about our sort of idea that we do on this podcast, which is the idea that the United States is in the middle of a political realignment. Um, and that's something you've actually written a lot about. How do you think the idea of a realignment of the parties and the coalitions, does that intersect at all with what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think, so I wrote a column four mm. years ago that in a way previewed a little bit of, the book, and happily, is still relevant today. It's always good when you have old columns that are still relevant. Where It was called Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, and the Revolt Against Decadence. Yeah. And basically the idea was that both the center-right and the center-left in different ways, Obama-era liberalism and sort of Romney-Ryan conservatism, were stewards of this decadence, basically sort of assuming that you should just keep having the same arguments and doing the same things over and over again and sort of maintaining stability, which obviously has its advantages, there are worse things than stability, and keeping ideas for dramatic transformation or radical change to the fringes. And that sort of model, I think, really broke down on both the left and the right in the second half of Obama's presidency. Um, And I think there's just a sort of general, there's a general discontent with this kind of comfortable stagnation that is 
I think, manifested maybe more for older Americans in the kind of nostalgic futurism that is associated with Trump in certain ways. Make America Great Again is, in a way, basically saying, remember when we went to the moon and yes. the future was supposed to be like that? How did it end up like this? Um, and then on the left, there's, I think, something similar around Bernie Sanders that's more appealing um, to young people politically, but it's basically saying, you know, wh wh why did we get lost on the way to the Scandinavian utopia, right? Why can't we actually get there after all? And so both of the forces that are trying to realign our politics. Um, the populist left and populist right. The populist right. left and the mm -hmm. populist right uh, come out of a discontent with the stagnation that has defined us and seems set to maybe define us for a while. Well, this is interesting. Ross, you tweeted about this. And I, I mean, this, in the context, we're taping this, obviously one of the apexes of Sanders' political career. He's got the popular vote in three separate primary or caucus elections. And you said that Trump has accelerated the uh, realignment of parties along new class, education, and gender lines, but that Sanders would probably decelerate that realignment. How do you square that, given that, you know, Trump and Sanders are kind of precipitate the realignment, but you think that a Sanders nomination versus Trump or I guess it's the Trump of 2020, not 2016, would decelerate it? Or am I oversimplifying? Because I, I found it a really interesting point. I, I think it's more the idea that if you have, you know, it's just the idea of a force pushing one way and a force pushing the other, right? Mm -hmm. So Sanders is feeding off this, in many cases, some of the same anxieties and discontents as Trump. But what that means is that he's going to compete, not for all of the same voters, but for at least some of the same mm -hmm. voters, right? There's a certain kind of both sort of older white blue collar voter and maybe younger black or Latino voter who's a little bit Trump curious right now. And those are voters, if you look at the polls, who are, they're, they're less likely to vote for sort of embodiments of upper class liberalism, people who are seen as sort of embodiments of, um, you know, the sort of academic liberal elite. Uh, which I think extends to encompass Elizabeth Warren and Michael Bloomberg in certain ways, even though in policy terms they're totally different. Mm -hmm. So Sanders pulls some of those voters. Sanders basically prevents Trump from consolidating a kind of working class populism as the base of the GOP. So you can have a world where Sanders is doing the same kind of thing as Trump, but precisely because he's doing the same kind of thing, you get a kind of stasis. Whereas if the Democrats ran... Pete Buttigieg, the realignment would sort of probably proceed further. You'd have Certainly. more upper middle class suburbanites moving into the Democratic Party and more lower middle class minority voters and white working class voters swinging towards Trump, Does that, mm. if that makes sense. No, it, it certainly makes sense. I guess it raises the question of how, what does that actually look like? This is something I spend a lot of time on in my other job at the Hill, which is what does it actually look like when the left and the right are kind of squabbling over working class, uh, working class voters? Does it m inherently mean the GOP just has to focus on suburban voters or could it be a real contest? In that? I think it can be a real yeah. contest. I mean, I think you've seen this on the Democratic side, right? There is, after Trump's victory, there's sort of been an open question of where, you know, what does the party do? So does the party keep following following Hillary and try and win more suburbanites who used to vote Republican? Does it try and win back Obama-Trump voters? You know, how does this interact, sorry, how does this interact with trends among the younger generation? How does it interact with minority voters? And, you know, and, and the Democratic primary, they haven't said this overtly because the whole party has sort of moved to a kind of left orthodoxy on a lot of issues that's made Democratic debates sometimes not that interesting. Um, but there is, I think, clearly a sense in which Sanders... Sanders versus Buttigieg, for instance, just represent very different ideas of yeah. where the party could go. And so I think under, if Sanders is elected president, I think then the next Republican primary will feature a sort of similar debate. There will be a Josh Hawley or a Tucker Carlson figure or a Donald Trump Jr. figure <laughs> saying, look what Trump did. You know, we need to take the working class back from Bernie or continue mm -hmm. our consolidation of the working class. And there'll be another candidate saying, a Nikki Haley, let's say, saying, no, we've got this socialist in power. Now is the time to, you know, abandon populism and get back to the tried and true, you know, limited government, 
formulas make Reaganism great again. Right. That that kind of thing. So I think there's I think there'll be a contest if the Democrats win this election, you know, a lot will depend on how they govern or if they can govern, but there will definitely be a contest on the right over what lessons to learn from the partial realignment mm-hmm. under Trump. So, so something that I've always enjoyed about your writing is your focus on sort of failures of the meritocracy or like the specific, and not even the failures, but even the, the specific sort of profiles and assumptions of sort of the successful yuppie sort of that those sort of adjacent crews how do you think my people your yes, people yes. of course we can say cosmopolitan <laughs> um <laughs> how do you think democratic elites especially up and coming ones how are they going to style themselves in a democratic party that's closer to bernie sanders because you sort of look at mayor pete and you sort of you sort of see him very clearly as this sort of he's sort of the ma- he's sort of obama to the max in the sense of ivy league worldly How, but, my, but, my friend i, I have <laughs> no, to use please. this my friend michael yeah. brendan doherty had this line in a national review piece where he said that he's like the it's like they were making an obama in the laboratory yeah. and he was like version 1.0 yes. but he somehow escaped from the laboratory <laughs> now, now running for president <laughs> um but yeah i mean i i think that i think that model of sort of meritocratic self-presentation is under a lot of stress definitely among younger liberals and there's sort of a socialist versus woke divide that you can see among younger liberals that sort of plays out in Sanders versus Warren at the same time I think it's totally possible that in a Sanders presidency there would be a sort of full fusion of those types and you would just have woke socialism or mm. socialist wokeness i don't know i mean a lot depends i, on I actually think that's the most likely yeah course I, I think i think that's right. i think that's possible i think at the very least what you def- <coughs> what you see is a it, especially in the realms of sort of education and schools and parenting and that kind of competition i think one reasonable explanation for some of the woke turn is that it's people getting tired of meritocracy and looking for other modes of Mm -hmm. value and well-being and assessment and if you wanted to be maximally cynical about it which we can be for the sake of (laughs) argument you would say it's white younger it's sort of you know millennial era white people who are about to are becoming parents and who realize that in a pure meritocracy, they're about to be outcompeted by East and South Asians. Mm-hmm. And so we need to, you know, we, we need to get rid of the Stuyvesant, <laughs> the Stuyvesant <laughs> admissions process while right. we can and implement something fuzzier. But even if you don't go that far in cynicism, I definitely think there's there's a change from when I was in college. When I was in college, there was a sense that, like, you know, meritocracy was it was just great. It was just what yep. you what you did. And I think there's sort of an exhaustion with that ladder and the competitiveness required to climb mm. that ladder that is slowly setting in among people younger than me who are who are still meritocrats by any reasonable yes. definition. So I think it's good to dive into the book then and the actual theme. So I think you articulated this before when you're talking about how we stagnated economically and technologically, but sort of I want you to respond to sort of the generic sort of, I think the conventional wisdom, because I think people could feel like we're stagnating, but if you think about it, it's sort of difficult as we have the internet, right? So it's not just that there's, you know, a cell phone in your pocket. It's actually the idea that you could instantly transmit information anywhere. We have all these sort of tech, like why, why, why does that represent stagnation since the fifties? So it's obviously not complete stagnation, right? And, you know, any non-decadent society will have pockets of decadence and institutions that are decadent and so on. And similarly, you can be a decadent society and have areas that are still dynamic. And the zone of communication and simulation together is a non-decadent area of American society. Now, that being said, I also think there are ways in which we sort of talk ourselves into the idea that that kind of amazing progress was the only progress we could reasonably expect. And in fact, if you go back and read, you know, sort of futurisms and science fiction, but also just sort of attempts to project things forward from the 50s and 60s, there was a lot more optimism about everything from space exploration, not not going to Alpha Centauri, but, you know, doing doing sustained things in space, 
um, optimism about energy production. We actually haven't had energy <laughs> revolutions. Right. Um, the green revolution happened and was amazing, but it happened now 50 years ago. Amazingly. 70s. The 70s, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So 40, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not 50 ago. yet. Right. Um, and and y you just haven't had, I mean, w w you haven't had dramatic change in arenas that aren't connected to Silicon Valley. And this is a point that Robert Gordon, who's a famous economist whose work I basically pilfer from, from the book, makes in his own analysis of stagnation. He says, you know, in the real peak of the Industrial Revolution, you had constant progress ac across multiple dimensions. Um, and in the age of the Information Revolution, you have progress across one dimension. And I think, again, this is visible in productivity statistics, right? You get a slowdown in productivity growth, which is, you know, an imperfect but pretty good measure of technology's effect on work and life. And then you get an acceleration in the first dot-com boom. So you, the internet has a real effect right there for about 10 years. Um, and then by the mid-2000s, it's leveled off again. Right. And you're back to, to stagnant productivity growth. And this, you know, there are, are that it could be that we're having forms of technological progress that don't show up in those statistics, and probably we are. If you look at something like, you know, the scientists who are mapping the genomes of, of ancient peoples on Earth, right? That's an incredible technological breakthrough in the sense that you can do sort of, you know, genetic mapping for fossilized populations, mm -hmm. basically. That doesn't affect the wider economy, and there are probably a lot of different examples like that. But there were also expectations, not 40 years ago, but, you know, when we mapped the human genome, when I was basically a teenager, there was an expectation that you would have large-scale sort of genetic therapies and genetic engineering. And that may happen, but it's coming very slowly for all the amazingness of breakthroughs in CRISPR and so on. Or, you know, there's an expectation 10 years ago, five years ago, that self-driving cars would be on the road. And... They are on the road, sort of, but they don't drive in the rain or the snow. Right. <laughs> and suddenly, people are pe the people who were so optimistic five years ago were saying, well, actually, we've solved 90% of the problem, but the last 10% is this huge hurdle. And I think there's just a ton of that in society right now. And you see it, too, in how Silicon Valley spends its money. Silicon Valley companies tend to be really successful when they're focused on the compu computers and the Internet. But when they try and revolutionize blood draws <laughs> to take the Theranos example or off or real estate to take the WeWork example, they raise a lot of money and spend it and build a big company that doesn't actually have a business model. Well, that's interesting, Sagar, I want you to jump in, but you actually yeah. just sort of spoke to an issue that you've had in tech company valuations because you had all these, your point here is that tech has been this only, has been the area where we've seen all the economic progress. There were all these companies like WeWork and Theranos that, and even Uber in some ways that tried to claim they were tech companies when they actually kind of weren't. So even parts of the economy where we're seeing stagnation are trying to dress themselves up um, as sort of the, 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 the technologies in the right. first place. Just for access to capital. Also. Right. I mean, yeah. Uber, well, Uber, Uber is, a, it is a technology company in the sense that smartphone technology makes it way easier to hail a cab yes. than it otherwise would have been. But the fundamental product is still a more efficient cab. taxi cab company. <laughs> Which we can't really find a way to make cheaper. Right. <laughs> There's yeah. a cushion, but it's, yeah. We found to make it cheaper by unbundling, you know, traditional employer-employee relations. Right. Well, and it's not clear, you know, it's it's not clear to me from reading Uber skeptics for a while that they have made it cheaper. I think there's, you know, we'll see. We'll give it a, you know, in another five years, we'll have a clearer sense of of where Uber is going. But there are ways in which it seems like they still haven't solved the problems that prevented taxi cab companies <laughs> from just being Uber. They just happen to have billions of dollars to sort right. of work with the taxi cab companies don't. Here, I want to ask you something interesting. Somebody in, wrote a, a column about the chief divide on the right. It just came out this week. It wasn't very charitable to me, but I'll quote from it anyway. <laughs> and it was basically saying that the chief divide among the American right right now, amongst reformicons, of which you were a father of, and I think this is uh, something Grand, that... Grandfather. Maybe, grandfather yeah. of. Yeah. And this very much relates to the book was, do you believe the last 40 years were good? And if you do, then you find yourself on one side of economic proposals. And if you don't, you find yourself, I would say, on the more extreme you know, yep. side of the proposals. I'm taking from your book that this is kind of an ode to that, to that second half, which is that the, the last 40 years weren't good. 
And and that's what we see in the, in your answer on stagnation in particular. I, I just love you yes. to explain it to these people who are like, no, the last 40 years were great, you know, just a little bit of tinkering well, on well, the edge. In a we way, I mean, in a way, you could say I'm trying to bridge the divide, mm-hmm. right? By saying the last 40 years weren't a disaster, right? They weren't, you know, the argument you sometimes get on the left that, you know, neoliberalism and Ronald Reagan destroyed the welfare state sure. and so on and, and, you know, doomed American workers to immiseration. That isn't right. The last, the last couple generations have seen stagnation and drift and repetition at a high level of wealth and development, right? And there are obviously worse things than that. And so I have sympathy for people who look at that trend and say, look, we've continued to make some modest progress here and there, and we're the richest country the world has ever known, and why would you want to take a gamble on Donald Trump's populism or Bernie Sanders' socialism? At the same time, I think the fact that so many people do want to take that gamble is itself evidence for your side of the equation, mm-hmm. right? That that there is something that something in this tangle of culture and economics has made people willing to entertain having first Trump and then, you know, a guy who used to praise the Sandinistas, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, right, in the White House. And you can't just wait. And, and this is true all across the Western world and not right. only the Western world, right? You can, And you can't just wave that away and say, well, people just, you know, don't appreciate how good they have it. Clearly there is there is a problem. And yeah, my view is basically it's less of a less of a disaster and more of a malaise. But it's a malaise that if you just let it continue can lead very gradually to dystopia. I mean, here's a specific example mm. of your point, right? Yeah. Today on Twitter, um, someone posted a chart of teenage behaviors and it showed that over the last 20 years, teenagers have gotten better behaved along a bunch of metrics. And, you know, they're less likely to drive drunk. They're less likely to get pregnant. They're less likely to use certain drugs. But they're more likely to play video games. Yeah, there you go. And this is sort of a Rorschach test, right? And <laughs> the line could have also included teen depression and teen suicide going up, right? So my view is that it's not a great trade off if we say teenage life is safer than it used to be, but also more alienating, depressing, and focused on simulated forms of experience but not everybody agreed and to sort of fit the paradigm perfectly david french right yes. sort of an embodiment of, <laughs> of start the a new fight yeah, let's do that here. <laughs> was like call of duty is much better than you know getting drunk down by the reservoir and i guess the case you know that in a way that's the case for decadence and and I don't, and it's true. I don't want my kids getting drunk down by the reservoir. On the other hand, when I stole the speed bumps out of my high school parking lot, you know, I was striking a blow against decadence. Yeah, and you <laughs> yeah. want, you do want some of that energy <laughs> in teenage life, right. as risky as it is. So I think speaking of teenagers, yeah. that relates to I think a point which can get controversial: sterility. Right, sort of the argument about declining birth rates, which is also one which whatever the right engages in leads to sort of, I think, really bad faith attacks. Like, well, could you just expand the thought on like the fact that Western society, actually industrialized societies in general have declining birth rates? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very, it's, it's a very weird and hard to fully explain reality, right? Because it totally makes sense that with, you know, it better in decreased infant mortality and a transition to a post-agrarian economy that you would have birth rates fall. Um, and if you go back to the 1950s and 1960s, around the time of the surprising to them baby boom, there was this assumption that, okay, birth rates will fall and they'll settle at around the number of kids people say they want, which is 2.3 or something. So slightly above replacement, population growth will continue and you'll have this sort of post-agrarian equilibrium. And instead, they've just kept falling. And for a long time, the US was an outlier, but since the Great Recession, we're no longer an outlier, we're down to European levels. And meanwhile, East Asia, um, you know, South Korea has a birth rate at half replacement level. Mm. You say, like, in the book, Israel is the only sort of is- outlier now. Israel is the only major outlier. You can find some minor outliers, but Israel is the only major outlier for among rich countries, and they're, they're at, like, 3.2, I think. Um, and, you know, this, when conservatives have brought this up, they get accused of, you know, wanting to roll back 
gains to women's opportunity. Right. And you so want to keep and, women in the home, and Ross, it's, just and be it's honest. Totally, look, right. I mean, look, yeah. it's, it's, there's obviously, you know, a thread of that woven mm. through conservative polemic on this issue. But at the same time, I think we've now, my, my view is we've reached a point where this is sort of an obvious enough problem that people on the left, including very much the feminist left, are talking mm. about it too. And they're just more likely to say, well, it's late capitalism's fault, right? Right. Um, but no, there's some. There is a there is a basic issue that I think, as far as we can tell, is connected to relations between the sexes. That uh, you know that it's not. It's married couples' fertility is lower than it used to be, but it's not that low. And what's actually happening is that people are just less and less likely to successfully pair off and get married. And you know, at the I mean, I think that is the most basic definition of what I'm calling decadence, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have a society that's reached this level of wealth and opportunity and suddenly it can't find a way to not have 15 kids, but to reproduce itself at a basic at replacement kids, level. At, replace, yeah. at literally at replacement level. <laughs> well, yeah. the, I mean, as we've talked with you know many people on this podcast, they've heard us with George Will and, and others, they'll say, well, this is a problem of the soul, Ross. This isn't a problem of the government itself. Obviously, I mean, I think I, I think I know where you fall on that. but I've heard I mean, that statecraft is soulcraft, yeah, yeah. my friend. <laughs> well, we Didn't someone write a book like we that? Brought, we brought that up to him, and he, he said is, he's, he is repudiated. he's I know. only he's, gotten more libertarian he's over time. One of the only people I know who's actually done that. But, I mean, so what – I mean. That is still a, a, a major strain of thought throughout the conservative movement today. What is your response to them? I mean, it's not totally wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Like, clear, let's not throw out the baby. Yeah. The clearly, I mean, here. clearly, clearly, this is a issue of, if not the soul, at the very least, the culture, mm -hmm. and it's an issue that is entangled with male-female relationships after feminism. That's entangled, maybe you know, with internet dating and its effects on courtship right now. It might be entangled with pornography. Um, but at the same time, one, you can, build, you can build economic structures that provide a foundation for cultural renewal, even if they can't make the cultural renewal itself happen automatically, right? right? So if people find a way to pair off and get married more often, you want there to be a system in place that makes it easier for them to then make the decision to have kids. And the reality is that the economics of child rearing have changed a lot over the last 50 and obviously the last 500 years. And, you know, the costs of raising a kid have gone up. Um, the sort of basic reality of the modern economy is that having, having a kid is just as, you know, it's just as labor intensive <laughs> as it was a few a mm -hmm. few decades ago. There isn't some amazing labor saving computer that takes care of your kids for you. Um, and those costs Well, it depends which class you are. Because well, right. there's the, well, no, because right. there's an interesting <laughs> but like yeah. if you can have I mean if you're if you're not if you're not opposed to the idea of let's say old age insurance, which I know some people on the right mm -hmm. are, but if you're not opposed to that idea, that sort of adaptation to changing conditions, then you shouldn't be opposed, I think, to programs and policies that are more supportive of families. And they do have, a, have an impact on the margins. You're yeah. not going to get your birth rate from 1.6 to 2.4 on pro-family policy, but you might get it from 1.6 to 1.8. And that's hundreds of thousands <laughs> or millions of human right. beings <laughs> who wouldn't have existed without those programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... I think what's hard for, I think, a lot of people is that if you're looking at these sort of trend lines you've identified, they all basically rely on functioning institutions. Those institutions right. don't have to just sort of be government. They could be churches. They could be civil society. Insert random Burke quote here. Um, <laughs> but how does one address these issues when institutions themselves are failing? Yeah, is there, it seems like there's a chicken or the egg problem. Sure. There. And and I don't, I don't come out of this book as you've can tell from reading it with a, you know, five point policy plan for we just do optimism here. <laughs> I mean, I you know, I wrote I wrote a policy book, gosh, two thousand eight, twelve, yeah, thirteen a, years ago mm -hmm. now, right? Um, and I think that it was it was written at a moment when decadence seemed less advanced, so it maybe had a slightly more optimistic spirit than that than this book. But I think the you know the basic arguments I made there are similar to the ones I just made to you here that. Mm -hmm. Government can't fix civil society, but it can do things that 
make it easier for people who are trying to fix civil society, basically. Um, and those can range from support for people who are getting married and having kids to, you know, not pointlessly picking culture war fights with churches, right? Um, and so there's there's a range there's a range of things that you can do. And there's also, I think we, you know, you can have more of an appreciation for macroeconomic policymaking too, right? That, you know, a lot of conservatives spent the Obama years freaking out about inflation that never happened. And in fact, Donald Trump's approach, you know, Donald Trump's quest for full employment, <laughs> right, is not fixing civil society, but it's helping low-income men get jobs mm -hmm. and get raises. And that has some positive effect on their marriage ability. It, you know, it's coaxing people off the disability rolls to have to be closer right. to full employment. All these problems that are partially cultural, right? It's a cultural problem if people who don't need disability are taking it. But you get a hot enough economy, they come off the disability rolls, you've done something about that problem. So I think there are, it's, it's not, to, to recognize the sort of deep entanglement of forces driving decadence is not a reason for, it's a reason for realism, but it's not a reason for despair. It's not mm -hmm. a reason not to try on the margins to use policy to create a context in which people can fight decadence, even if the policies themselves don't magically do away with it. Yeah. So something I'm looking to understand is cultural exhaustion, right? Because you're referencing Star Wars, you're referencing Marvel, you said this at the beginning, we're rehashing things, but isn't Shakespeare just rehashing something, right? The ancient Greeks and Romans, they rehashed, you know, the gods for a couple of centuries there. You know, and, and that's that's saying it lightly, but, yeah. but, but you know. This is just Marshall's defense of the Marvel universe. Yeah, yeah I love the, I love the yeah. MCU. I hate the new Star Wars movies, but, I don't, but I, I don't think inherently templates that can be sort of symbolizing myth and symbolizing things. That, like, for example, some Marvel movies are about the deep state. Like, that's Captain America Civil War. Like, that's, you know... Captain, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but look, I mean, I, I think that there is a subtle but really important difference here, and I'm going to use Star Wars rather than Marvel to illustrate it, right, which is that the first Star Wars movie is not an original movie using ideas or images that have never been seen before. It's a pastiche, right? You've got Kurosawa, and you've got Buck Rogers, and you've got Triumph of the Will. Dogfighting from World right, War II. You've got, you've all, got all of these things put together, and none of it, you know, George Lucas didn't, you know, didn't invent any of it. He just put it all together in a product, a cultural product that was novel for that particular moment. And... And then sort of with some help from script doctors was able to deepen that towards something more psychologically interesting in The Empire Strikes Back. Um, <laughs> and we'll leave aside the Ewoks. But so then, then Lucas tries to deepen it further in a way in, um, in the prequels. And the prequels, too, were not trying to do something or original in the sense that there had never before been the story of the decline of the Republic and the corruption of a noble... We're living it figure, right now. Right? We know right? these things. <laughs> right? So, but, but, he was, but nobody had made a huge special effects-driven blockbuster that did that successfully. He tried. It was a, in hindsight, an actually kind of ambitious, impressively ambitious effort and a total failure. He didn't have the <laughs> capacity to do it. The movies were terrible. And then you get the more recent Star Wars movies, which just tell the same story. They aren't a pastiche, they're just a repetition. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, that's the distinction that I'd make that doesn't always hold perfectly, but I think applies to a lot of cultural production right now. The problem isn't that you're returning to old tropes or old images or themes, it's that you're doing literally the same thing. Star Wars The Force Awakens is literally a a like 80% yeah. yeah. beat to beat by beat remake. And, you know, The Rise of Skywalker ends in the same place <laughs> that Return of the Jedi ends. And there's a difference between that and, you know, Shakespeare taking Plutarch and doing something new but also old with it. The Marvel movies are a little bit of a different case and don't want to, you know, go too far i think the issue with the marvel movies is more their sort of fundamental early adolescence like they're movies that in which sort of sexual chemistry never really enters like they're always sort of caught at that moment of the origin story of your discovering your powers and figuring out how to use them and to my mind they just do that over and over and never sort of 
develop the story mm. beyond that. But I'm I I certainly agree that the MCU is less decadent than JJ. I mean, than <laughs> JJ Abrams is you need sort to have of, a decadent rating system. He's the embodiment yeah. of Hollywood decadence. Yeah, you should in a you way should that start that uh, a column on rating these movies on decadence. On decadence. I guess the last very uplifting uh, question I have is: Is it possible to have these types of novel cultural movies? I think you wrote a column when the rise of Roseanne, and you were talking about how the boomer culture is actually the only culture that we really have left across homogenous lines. Is it possible in a stratified America amongst all these different race, class, all these other different lines to have shared cultural experiences that are able to be mass produced by Hollywood? Or is it just endemic by the internet age, by where we are right now, that we're going to have siloed things and the only thing that really appeals to lots of people are things that we can all harken back to in our old cultural moments. I mean, it might that might be true, right? We had yeah. Game clearly, of Thrones for a second. Clearly, right. one reason that Marvel movies and effects-driven blockbusters generally are so successful is that it's not just about America. It's they translate well China, overseas, right. right? You have a global market. Global markets tend toward a kind of lowest, uh, sort of predictable lowest mm -hmm. common denominator of storytelling because you don't have to, you don't create the hurdles of cultural particularity. Um, that being said, uh, you know, 50 years ago, you had global cinema and it was Kurosawa doing Shakespeare, right? Yeah. I mean, it's in spite of the differences, in spite of those cultural differences, it was totally possible for Japanese filmmaking to interact fruitfully with European playwriting from the 16th century. And so I, I don't think it's entirely possible impossible to imagine that happening again and but honestly i feel like i would be content with the silos if it seemed like the silos were themselves a little more dynamic i mean mm. i think what's happened in part with pop culture is that it sort of consumed even the energy that used to be devoted to highbrow entertainment and i and i should say i'm guilty of this i find this in my own life right like i you know i spend my cultural consumption is very much in the sort of HBO and right. blockbuster cinema upper middle brow space and I'm not alone and as a result like the fine arts are sort of withering in American life so it's not like I think it would be fine if lots of people weren't going to art museums but art museums were still flourishing mm -hmm. lots of people Vibrant. weren't right lots of people weren't you know weren't re I mean yeah you, you, you see what I'm saying I think mm -hmm. I think s s being siloed by class and culture isn't the worst thing if there's creativity within those silos. And it's more, to me, it's more that this sort of repetitive middle brow pop culture has crowded out even that space as well. So to finish off, and not in policy terms, but do we have some sort of takeaway for how we can escape decadence? I mean, dying of the coronavirus, right? <laughs> That's definitely not decadent. Yes. Um, I, I think that the, I, I think in certain ways, and this is the subject of the last third of the book, but I think the escapes from decadence are obvious. They're just hard to necessarily achieve, right? Like a series of major technological breakthroughs would put an end to a certain kind of our decadence. A sort of a real realignment, right? What mm -hmm. is this podcast about? This podcast is about escaping political decadence, right? If you actually had will a... You write that on a book, if, book sleeve yeah, for I, us. There we go. Yes, I, I, <laughs> there will we go. Sign, I will sign your book afterward, right? That, <laughs> that, that the, you know, the successful form, and I'm not sure this can yeah. exist, but the successful form of conservative populism or the successful form of something new on the left could lead out of the political decadence that's been building. Um, and, you know, and in, in culture, you escape decadence by writing, you know, either pioneering the new art form or reinventing the old one in some profound way. And all of this is possible. And the case, in a way, the case for decadence, the reason not to despise it, is that it allows for that possibility in a way that both true dystopia and collapse do not. So even under decadence, it's possible to always be thinking about how to get out of it. And again, in an age of, you know, rampaging viruses... That's not the worst thing in the world. <laughs> well, Ross, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me. me.